in sustaining with the MGG and the immunocytology, we reserve a, a small portion of the sample to perform immunoglobulin heavy chain uh, rearrangement analysis using uh, PCR. Something that has become more and more popular uh, following the demonstration that uh, up to 70% of all vitreoretinal lymphomas have an MYD88 mutation is a MYD88 mutation analysis. And this was first described um, in 2015. More recently, um, people have also applied this MYD88 analysis looking at aqueous humor samples. So these are tiny samples, less than one milliliter in volume. Um, with uh, more and more knowledge about these tumors, people have also designed bespoke um, next generation sequencing panels, which have included uh, MYD88 and also other genes. And this has been taken forward, particularly by this group in Dumingen. And they recently presented how they've um, designed a next generation sequencing panel looking at all these different genes and uh, in this way you can perhaps more precisely diagnose uh, vitreoretinal lymphoma. Um, perhaps more on the research level, um, people have also been looking at microRNAs and it was shown by Vinod Kakaseri and co-workers that if you have a constellation of these microRNAs within the supernatant, i.e. the non-cellular component of the vitrectomy samples, then you can uh, distinguish chronic vitritis from uh, vitreoretinal lymphoma when applying this panel. So the major differential diagnosis, of course, uh, for vitreoretinal lymphoma is uh, an endophthalmitis, particularly a fungal endophthalmitis. Here is an example of a candida. Uh, this was in a vitrectomy sample. Here, this was in a taken from a chorioretinal biopsy. And this were, uh, these were in patients who were immunosuppressed as a result of um, uh, organ transplantation and also, unfortunately, IV drug, drug use. Um, this, this was also an extensive case in a patient following renal transplantation, and he developed the complications of an, uh, an aspergillus endophthalmitis. This was a, uh, an interesting case uh, where I was sent a vitrectomy sample where we could see quite clearly the toxoplasmosis cysts. Uh, the eye went on to be enucleated and you can see uh, that there was an extensive chorioretinitis. And within the chorioretinitis, we actually had these quite clear toxoplasmosis um, cysts, which are really quite um, striking. I know perhaps more commonly in India, uh, there are it, one of the major differential diagnoses is of a vitrectomy sample to rule out vitreoretinal lymphoma is mycobacteria. Um, I very rarely see such samples, but when speaking to some of my colleagues, including Dr. Arpan um, and Dr. Gita Vamaganti in Hyderabad, they apparently receive such samples at least once a week. So chorioretinal biopsies are undertaken in some centers. These are obviously performed by experienced vitreoretinal surgeons where perhaps the vitrectomy wasn't sufficient to make a definitive diagnosis. Uh, I guess the advantage of the chorioretinal biopsies is that we do receive a, a more tissue and we can um, analyze these tumor cells in more detail. And in this way, we've been able to better understand their, their um, genetic ba background and also any um, chromosomal translocations which may be present. So just to summarize then, vitreoretinal lymph uh, lymphoma, it is a high-grade B-cell lymphoma. Um, it, uh, I didn't go into details, but um, it, uh, in up to 70% of the cases, you have an MYD88 mutation. They have a very high load of somatic mutations, which is very similar to what you see in CNS lymphomas. And so there is a great deal of similarity between the vitreoretinal lymphomas and the CNS lymphomas. And more often than not, unfortunately, the patients do um, uh, develop CNS lymphoma and, uh, and have a poor prognosis subsequent to that. Through the analysis of the uh, chorioretinal biopsies, we've been able to demonstrate that these tumors, these diffuse large cell B cell lymphomas, probably belong to what are called the ABC subtype and are really uh, quite aggressive. 
So with respect to treatment, uh, this is a bit controversial, um, but um, it, I think more and more people are uh, concentrating on uh, chemotherapy, which is antibody directed, i.e. directed to, to using rituximab uh, against the anti-CD20 antigen on the B cells. Others have used, if it's only ocular disease, they use intravitreal methotrexate, uh, but you can obviously have the combination. This is a, a paper by um, Jose Polito, which unfortunately demonstrated the, the poor prognosis of these patients and therefore the, really the necessity to diagnose this disease as early as possible. Um, there are, just to emphasize that um, the anti-CD20 antibodies are really only approximately 30 years old um, and there are great developments in um, designing new anti-CD20 antibodies um, to overcome any uh, resistance uh, which may have developed under therapy uh, by the tumor cells. There are new treatments coming out which I don't have time to go into but it's just worth noting that CAR therapy, uh, CAR therapy is being considered in CNS uh, lymphomas. BCL2 inhibitors and MYD88 inhibitors have been demonstrated in vivo um, using um, uh, in CNS lymphoma trials. And of course, immunotherapy is also being applied in CNS lymphomas and is being considered in vitreo retinal lymphomas. So I'll just move briefly onto the uh, second most common type of intraocular lymphoma, which are the choroidal lymphomas. These are really quite rare in comparison to vitreo retinal lymphomas. They are, uh, occur uh, within the choroid. You can see that the retina the, uh, is detached but is not affected by the tumour. Uh, and it has been given a number of terms uh, in the literature, uh, the uveal pseudotumour, hyperplasia, but it was actually demonstrated by Ben Ezra in the 1990s that this was indeed a malignancy. And we, with the help of others at the AFIP, demonstrated that this was is indeed a, a so-called malt lymphoma. So this is a very advanced uh, uh, primary choroidal lymphoma. You can see the, the extent of the infiltration within the choroid and extending up into the ciliary body. What is typical of these lymphomas is that they, they use the uh, exit roots, um, which are offered by the um, uh, exiting uh, vortex veins and nerve, and they can extend um, posteriorly into the orbital tissue and also anteriorly. The, these, uh, the neoplastic cells are within the so-called marginal zone, so the germinal center is, uh, is reactive, but the marginal zone is, uh, contains the neoplastic cells, and they can quite often show a, a, um, quite a significant plasma cellular differentiation, which you can see either in the PAS stain or also using immunoglobulins such as the Kappa and Lambda stain, stains. If you, however, get a, a tiny intraocular biopsy, you'll see that these cells are very the same size as red blood cells. So they're small B cell lymphomas. They stain with CD20, but also with CD79A. And they have a very low um, proliferation rate. So this is a low-grade B cell. So just to emphasize, this is a, a low-grade B cell lymphoma. They're distinctly different from the vitreoretinal lymphomas, which are highly aggressive. The primary choroidal lymphomas do not have an association with the CNS. Um, and uh, they are more often than not recognized and treated with low-dose radiotherapy. Okay. Just to then briefly mention primary iris lymphomas, these are exceptionally rare. There have been approximately uh, between um, a, well, approximately a dozen cases reported in the literature, perhaps a few more in the last couple of years. This was a case which I received when um, reporting still in Germany, and this uh, was a, a 42 year old who had manifestation in her iris. Um, it was a high-grade B-cell lymphoma, and unfortunately, within a short period, she developed systemic disease um, and um, passed from that disease. Just to mention that very recently, I collaborated with Vinod Kakaseri and Professor Ludwig Heindl in Bonn, 
and this paper this uh, where we've suggested um, guidelines for the diagnosis and treatment of iris lymphomas you can find in survey of ophthalmology and hopefully this will be published soon finally there are secondary uveal lymphomas which can occur and we don't actually know the actual incidence of these but these occur in patients who have a systemic non-Hodgkin lymphoma and then as a late manifestation the disease occurs within typically within the choroid and this here is an example of a CLL a chronic lymphocytic leukemia occurring within the choroid um, and an, an example of a, a, an exceptionally rare case of intravascular uh, B-cell lymphoma uh, which um, was um, seen in this case and was extensive not in only within the choroid but also within the anterior uveal structures. So just to summarize there are a number of different types of intraocular lymphomas the most common vitreoretinal lymphoma followed by the um, primary choroidal lymphomas you can get um, secondary choroidal lymphomas which are secondary manifestations of systemic non-Hodgkin lymphomas and then you can have exceptionally rare varieties such as the iris lymphomas. So I, uh, uh, 12 years ago, I wrote this review together with Professor D'Amato. And I must say, I don't think over those, uh, the last 12 years, much has changed. So if anybody is interested in having a copy of this paper, I'm happy to send around a PDF at the end of uh, the symposium. So then just moving on to the ocular nexal lymphomas. Um, as I mentioned before, they most commonly occur in the conjunctiva and the orbit. So, and the most common is the um, extranodal marginal zone B cell lymphoma or the MOLT lymphoma for short. These show the typical features uh, I mentioned before with the neoplastic cells within the marginal zone. These can extend into the overlying conjunctiva and create what are called lymphoepithelial lesions. They can also in, uh, infiltrate into the lacrimal gland, for example, in the orbit. Um, and cause um, quite significant proptosis and visual problems. So there, I'm sure you've all heard that there is, was a proposal that there was an association with Chlamydia sitaki. Uh, this was described by um, Ferrari and co-workers in Milan, in Italy. Um, it was quite controversial and as a result of that, uh, Estelle Chanoudet uh, set up a, a multi-center collaborative study and samples were sent to her and she looked at the association and actually found that there, um, this association was only existed interestingly in northern Italy. Since then um, it has also been described I think in South Korea. So it is really I think um, quite uh, an exceptional finding and in the vast majority of cases there is no association with chlamydia. That being said, some patients are treated with doxycycline um, just to, uh, with, with the off chance that it may cause regression of the tumour. There are a number of different uh, genetic alterations associated with ocular nexa, or the mold lymphomas of the ocular nexa. This includes um, various translocations, but recently it was also described by the Cambridge group that there was an A20 um, deletion um, and this indeed was associated with a poor prognosis. A20 deletions can be determined using molecular techniques but it also was also demonstrated you can use an antibody uh, on a regular basis if you don't have access to these molecular platforms. So the main differential diagnosis of the MOLT lymphoma is um, a simple reactive lymphoid hyperplasia and so you really have to look at the morphology of the lesion that you're sent and undertake a, uh, an immune panel to rule out a reactive lymphoid hyperplasia and indeed you may have to do the um, IGH PCR to demonstrate clonality if you're um, if you really think it is indeed a lymphoma. The other uh, Differential diagnoses include the follicular lymphoma um, and another small cell B cell lymphoma, which really shouldn't be overlooked, in, uh, namely the mantle cell lymphoma. 
mantle cell lymphomas are very aggressive B cell lymphomas compared to the malt lymphomas. And more often than not, when uh, a mantle cell lymphoma occurring within the ocular nexa tends to be a secondary manifestation of an underlying uh, systemic mantle cell, mantle cell lymphoma. And of course, you can have quite aggressive diffuse large cell B cell lymphomas, which occur in the orbit. And then something that you also always must exclude is a Burkitt lymphoma, particularly if you're receiving samples from um, places such as, uh, as, as Africa and indeed India. So there are fancier techniques which exist, um, not so much within the diagnostics, but can, uh, within the research area. And they are next generation sequencing panels, which have been designed also for the ocular nexal lymphomas. Um, and this was work done by Kenny and co-workers in the States, where they designed a next generation sequencing panel with all these different genes to help differentiate between the malt and marginal or the malt lymphomas, the marginal zone B cell lymphomas, follicular lymphomas, and diffuse large cell B, lymph B cell lymphomas. Um, and they use this on a regular basis. I guess the advantage of the next generation sequencing panels that you, is that you can undertake a large number of investigations simultaneously. And uh, if, particularly if you're using a pyro sequencer, as this is what this is, then you can uh, apply this technique on formal and fixed paraffin embedded samples. So in 2002, I passed my specialist exams. And at that stage, we were only inverted commas required to come up with a, a diagnosis. More and more, there's an emphasis on pathologists to come up with not only the diagnosis, but also on, uh, on the basis of various molecular panels where being asked to um, predict the response and even prognosticate uh, with respect to the, the lesions that we're diagnosing. So, and all of this is being uh, expected almost in real time now um, uh, and as quickly as possible. So there is, and I'm sure it's happening across the world, there's an incorporation of digital pathology and uh, talking via live web, web links with your clinician who's seeing images that um, you're seeing on your screens. And instead of having a simple written, um, um, typewritten report, uh, you may have to include some of the molecular pathology images in the report. And everything is being linked up, which I think it has advantages, particularly when it comes to data analysis. So, and to what is perhaps more and more testing is that we're getting smaller and smaller biopsies. We're no longer getting so perhaps nice big chunks of tissue where we can apply a range of antibodies, but we're getting smaller and smaller biopsies consisting only of perhaps 50 cells or even less than 10 cells. And then there's even an increasing demand that we may be able to make the diagnosis on the basis of blood samples, urine samples, and even, even breath biopsies. This is perhaps becoming a bit more, more science fiction. So when your um, ocular oncologists phone you, um, which I hope they do, um, I, and they ask you how the sample should be sent to you, then please don't recommend glutaraldehyde. Glutaraldehyde was used by perhaps the um, older pathologists um, because it does have an advantage that it doesn't cause retinal uh, detachment. And it was used for particularly electron microscopy. However, the problem with glutaraldehyde is that it's very difficult then to perform a wide range of immunohistochemistry. And also it's very difficult to perform any uh, DNA or RNA extractions. So if you, your ocular oncologist sends you a tissue biopsy, then that should be put in buffered formalin. And a whole range of different molecular techniques can be undertaken on these samples. If they send you fluid samples, then I actually don't like formalin. I much prefer something called cytolite or hope fixation, which are soft fixation um, preservatives. And do an, and allow you to undertake immunocytology, and also extract DNA from uh, from the samples. If, however, you, um, there is a differential clinical differential diagnosis of um, perhaps an endophthalmitis, then it is recommended that that some of your samples are sent fresh, so that 
they can be worked up within the uh, microbiology department. So, but first and foremost, you should recommend to your ocular oncologist that they speak to you and or that they contact you uh, via email to let you know when the sample may be arriving. And it's highly uh, recommended that you, they do not send the samples on a Friday afternoon after 4 p.m. because more often than not, those samples will only be received on a Monday. And if they're not in a some sort of preservative, then I don't think we'll be able to get much of an answer out of those biopsies. So just to conclude, the morphology and immunophenotype uh, of the any sample, I think, um, provide the baseline and gold standards for making any diagnostics. Um, these molecular tests, they're all great, but they are adjunctive tests. Um, and increasingly, we're getting bespoke uh, next generation sequencing panels designed for our ocular cancers, which I think are great. And this does enable targeted therapy, particularly if there is a particular mutation such as MYD88, which might be targetable in future. And it's only through this concerted effort, since these tumors are rare, that we'll be able to improve the outcomes, particularly of those patients with vitreoretinal lymphoma. Now, just to um, conclude, um, blood and thunder, if you hadn't realized, this was, um, is an expression, or it was first actually used, um, or is used um, to describe bloodshed and violence. Um, and one of the first books to use it as, as, as a title is um, by Hampton, Hampton Sides, describing the American West. But actually, it was first mentioned as an expressive oath or a swear word um, in 1751 by Tobias Smollett in The Adventures of Peregrine Pickle. But I, I think Arpan will explain later why he chose this title, Blood and Thunder, for this webinar. My uh, contact details are here. So if anybody has any questions or would like me to provide any um, PDFs of articles or even a copy of this, uh, these slides, uh, please contact me at this address. Uh, you're more than welcome to them. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you, Dr. Sarah. That was absolutely wonderful. Are there any questions? I can see a question on the chat box. I have a question for you, Dr. Sarah. How common, what's the commonest intraocular lymphoma that you come across? The commonest is, is vitreoretinal lymphoma. Okay. And the histological one, which is the commonest. Okay, sorry, Arpan, would you like me to put, well, the most, the most common histological subtype is a diffuse large cell B cell lymphoma. Okay. okay, and there was a question uh, on the chat box. Okay. How common is the Burkitt lymphoma of the conjunctiva and any role of the EBV serology for the same? Okay, so how common is the Burkitt's lymphoma of the conjunctiva? It's actually quite rare. It's probably we're looking, looking in, in the range of um, less than 10%, I'd say probably between 5 and 10%. Um, it, can, it can be associated with EBV. Um, uh, and we do perform the EBV testing in, within the tumour. And you can uh, you can detect that using in situ. Um, so I don't know whether I've asked, answered all of the questions. <laughs> oh, you have, you have, you have. Uh, Doctor uh, Arpun. Yes, yes, please. Can I have a question for Doctor Sara? Sure, sure, please. Yeah. Hi, Doctor Sara. Uh, so one question that I have for you is regarding uh, plasmoblastic lymphoma. So yeah. what would be the uh, uh, what would be the most important? immunohistochemical, you know, characteristic uh, feature in differentiating plasmoblastic lymphoma from plasmacytoma? Plasma, uh, 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 yeah. So, so um, the, main, the main thing would be the morphology. Okay. So, a plasmacytoma um, obviously would contain 
large number of plasma cells, but these plasma cells really would rec be recognizable, mature plasma cells. Whereas with a plasma blastoma, um, these cells really are quite undifferentiated. Typically, you have a cohesive um, growth pattern, and it can actually sometimes mimic al almost like a, a carcinomas. Since, um, as you probably know, since um, plasma cytomas and also plasma blastic lymphomas can lose the expression of CD20, the most important stain to perform is CD79A. So uh, it, is, it is not unusual for plasmablastic lymphomas to lose CD20. So you do a CD, you could do a CD3, a CD20, um, and still not be able to identify the, the cell of origin. If you do the CD79A, then uh, more often than not that that is still preserved on the plasmablastic lymphomas. Okay. And the, the role of EBER, positivity and negativity in that? So EBV can, uh, yeah, has been described obviously um, with um, plasma blastic lymphomas. Um, you, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head the exact proportion. Um, I think it, um, the plasma blastic lymphomas can occur in other sites. And I think the association with EBV is higher Oh, yeah. in other sites, so nasopharyngeal, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yes, you, I mean, if you have access to performing the EBA, then yes, that would be worthwhile doing. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Right. So Sarah, there are three more questions and then we'll go on to the next one. Yep. Uh, can you give us some information regarding new markers in PVRL? New markers in the book. Right. Um, I think the most important thing, uh, so immun uh, immunostain markers, is that what the question is? Um, I think the most important thing is it, whenever you receive a vitreoretinal, uh, a vitrectomy sample, is um, looking at the MGD, um, looking at the morphology of the cells. Um, and then typically what I would perform would be the CD3, CD20, and then the CD68PG, because sometimes uh, you can have a quite, um, you can have uh, macrophages or monocytes within the vitreous, which if it is an inflammation can look quite atypical. So it's, I think it's always important to do the CD68PG alongside the, the CD20. Um, if uh, nothing is still coming up with the CD20 and you're, you're pretty convinced that it is a B cell lymphoma, then I would do the CD79A. Um, if you notice the, there are the cell membranes are quite damaged, you can always use a um, PAX5 stain, which stains the nuclei. Um, so I think the, the choice of your antibodies, I think is very much dependent on looking at that first MGG stain. If the membrane, cell membranes are quite fragile, then I'd go for the PAX5. If they're reasonable, then I'd go for the CD20 and always do the CD3 and the CD68PG in parallel. Um, I always reserve a sample of the vitrectomy uh, so that we can extract the DNA we extract the DNA and then according to the concentration of the DNA, then we either do the MYD88 mutation or we do the IGH PCR analysis. The MYD88 mutation, mutational analysis requires a smaller concentration of DNA. So does that answer the question? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Sarah, I'm going to request you to please take on the question on the chat box. We'll move on to the next speaker because there are more than I am seeing more and more questions coming. So well, if, you, if, if people don't mind, I will answer the questions afterwards so I can sure. listen to sure. the other speakers as absolutely. well. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So, I'd, uh, if you could stop your screen share, please. Thank you. I'd like to introduce our next 
what is an associate professor comprehensive ophthalmology products, the immunomodulators in sebaceous carcinomas and she has a good study of 63 cases of the endocrine mucin producing sweat gland carcinoma. Her goal is to always a great teacher for, and I know that for sure for medical students, residents, fellows and other ophthal ophthalmologists. And Okay, Arpin, can you? Yeah, Hena, can you go to the slide, please? I'm getting a little feedback here. Let me let me screen share. Do you see my slides? From a lot of countries. Uh, yeah. Malaysia, the British ophthalmology uh, pathology group. From Saudi Arabia, Philippines, UK, and lots of other countries which I'm and of course from India and lots lots from down south too. LVPI. Great to Max. have you. Hello Max, can you please share Dr. Potter's slides? Yeah, let me just pull that up real quick. I just have to close out mine. One second. So on, on my screen it's saying when I go to uh, share screen, it says one participant can share at a time. So I just wondered if somebody else is sharing right now. Hmm. Let me see if what it says for me. Share screen. Um, share. Let's yeah, try this. Can you coming up, coming sharing up. is paused. Bring your shared window to the front. Max, do, you, do you see my slides? Um, yeah, you can I, see it. I have them. Well, this is on my computer, but I, you can I have see your slides. No problem. You can do. You can uh, do the. Uh, you can share them along there. That's okay. We can all see it. Go ahead. Did okay. you Did you rearrange the order from last night, Doctor Potter? Or Doctor Heather, can you see the slides? Uh, yeah, I did. So okay, uh, shoot. But not from this morning. I shared with you and Hannah this morning. Um. Okay. Max, if you go out of share screen, let me try yep. to do it one more time. All right. Let me see. Okay. I wonder if it just had some. It might let you do it now because it let me do it right away. Okay. Here we go. Share. Okay. Do you guys see it? Got it. Yep. Looks great. Great. Awesome. So I'm going to get started with one of our beloved uh, American authors, uh, Dr. Seuss. Um, and I thought that I would do this just to warm up my mouth. I went to a, a speaking conference one time and they said good tongue twisters are good to get you going. So, so here we go. Bed spreaders spread spreads on beds. Bread spreaders spread butters on breads. And that bed spreader better watch how he's spreading or that bread spreaders sure going to butter his bedding. Just click on your, your PowerPoint because it's probably on the Zoom window now. There we go. So mine's a bit more tame than blood and thunder. Uh, I'm doing bread and butter. To many, that means the mundane, the everyday, the simple stuff. But I am here to tell you that although bread may be made from very few simple household ingredients, it doesn't mean that it's simple. I don't know what everyone else was doing while at home during this COVID time, but I was offered some sourdough starter and gladly accepted this jar of goopy starter uh, and with a surprise accepted oops, here we go, three pages of recipe instructions, two 20 minute YouTube videos and something to do for 36 hours of my weekend. So simple in concept, yes, 
but possibly a lot more complex. We have specimens like this in the lab. We have routine, everyday things, easy diagnoses for our residents and fellows, but sometimes not easy, sometimes involving research or very time consuming. Today I'll introduce you to three simple specimens and teach you salient demographic and clinical presentation points. I'll teach you how to identify them histopathologically and teach you about some times when they might be more complex than simple bread and butter. So the case presentation is a 63-year-old woman with uh, really no past medical or ocular history who presented to oculoplastics with several hyperpigmented lesions in her right lower eyelid. They had a greasy stuck on appearance and were not painful, but sometimes bled with minor trauma. They were cosmetically bothersome to the patient as well. So she so, underwent extension so, of these lesions. And here you can see what we received in the eye pathology lab. So what you can see is skin, and you can tell it's skin because it's covered by keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium. You can see it has a polypoid shape. So we've got like a stalk here, and then we've got this kind of more cauliflowery looking configuration to it. This epithelium is thickened, um, and you can see that uh, the reedy pegs, the normal little pegs that help hold the epithelium on the dermis seem to be bridging. So here you can see some bridging, and then you can see some basal cell layer pigmentation here, and that's what gives these the color. Um, the other thing you can see here is a pseudo horn cyst. Now pseudo horn cysts can be a little confusing because they look like cysts. And so you would, might want to call them a cyst, but it's actually a pseudocyst. And it's a pseudocyst because, um, uh, let's see here, because these have connections with the surface. And so you can see there's like a little bit of keratin in this little divot. But when we cut them across like this, because the surfaces of these lesions are so undulating, we're gonna cut across some of them and it's gonna look like a little cyst here, but it's not really a cyst. So it's a pseudo horn cyst. Now, sometimes my residents and fellows has, have asked me, you know, what's the difference between this and a keratin pearl? Or they might start thinking that this looks like a keratin pearl. And so I thought I would just teach you how these contrast. So here's a squamous cell carcinoma. And you can see this island of uh, cancer cells in the dermis. And then you can see how they're forming this keratin pearl. It's a little bit different than our pseudo horn cyst, where we see that we've got normal epithelium. We've got this purple granular cell layer. That's the keratohyalin granules that make normal appearing keratin. And here you can see there's no keratohyalin granules and we've got abnormal keratin. In fact, there's uh, retained nuclei. So it's like perikeratotic. So our microscopic description in this was that we see this uh, stratified squamous epithelium forming papillary projections with hyperkeratosis, acanthosis, and bridging of those radii pegs. We see focal areas of pigmentation, and sometimes we see more pigmentation than other times, which is why these can be very dark or very light. Um, but we also see these pseudohorn cysts. Oftentimes, there is a bit of inflammation too. Um, and I think it's just because these uh, stick up, and so people kind of play with them or just kind of irritate them by rubbing and washing their face. Seborrheic keratoses um, are common benign epithelial proliferation. Um, they have other names, so we call them SKs a lot. Um, they can be called basal cell papillomas, senile warts, brown warts, wisdom warts, or barnacles. I kind of like wisdom wart. Uh, when I get mine in the future, I'm obviously fair skinned and I go out in the sun. Um, I'm gonna call mine wisdom warts and not barnacles. 
They are usually found on sun exposed areas in light skinned individuals and rarely may transform into squamous cell carcinomas. They appear greasy and stuck on and uh, are well circumscribed. They can be small or large, but they're usually fairly round to oval in shape. Um, when these uh, become irritated or if they start to have kind of a downward growth pattern rather than an upward growth pattern, they are termed inverted follicular keratoses. And those are slightly different because you don't see those pseudohorn cysts. Instead, you see these things called squamous eddies. And if you ever want to see those, come to my lab and I'll show them to you. Um, so here's the little bit of kind of blood and thunder. So um, if you have multiple seborrheic keratoses, that can be indicative of a lesser trilot sign. And lesser trilot sign can be a cutaneous manifestation of something um, deeper and worse, like GI cancer of the stomach or colon, squamous, squamous cell carcinoma, leukemia, or lymphoma. Please mute your mic. Yes, please continue. Which had been present for several months. She had tried conservative therapy and it was unsuccessful, so underwent incision and curatage. And just by the incision and curatage, you have an idea of what this might be. So on this tissue sample, we have amorphous tissue fragments. We don't have any epithelium to show us what it is. And they're kind of two distinct looking areas. So the first area, um, is right here on the right hand side of the screen. You can see it's a bit more purple and a bit more smeary or smudgy. You can see these tiny little cells here. So this is an area of necrosis and the smudging is DNA um, from necrotic cells. There are more neutrophils in this area, which means this was kind of like pussy stuff in the lesion. The other part of this shows much more eosinophilic tissue. There's a hypercellular area up here, which is mostly lymphocytes, plasma cells. I feel like I see a few little eosinophils in there as well. So some chronic inflammatory cells. And then the more pink areas, like around the edges here and over here, those are histiocytes that have become more like epithelium. They've wanted to clump together they've gotten more and pink cytoplasm in their nuclei change a bit. So we call them epithelioid histiocytes. Now that's uh, pathognomonic for granuloma. So when you see epithelioid histiocytes, that is granulomatous inflammation. As we know, granulomatous inflammation can be due to many different things, infectious, um, foreign bodies, um, and sarcoidosis, other things. And so what we try to figure out is where what's causing the granulomatous inflammation. And in this slide, you can see that we've got these little empty round spaces. And those are spaces where lipid used to be. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so here's just another view of those epithelioid histiocytes. So you can see how they kind of stick together, form a syncytium. In fact, sometimes the, the cytoplasm actually becomes one and then you get this large cell with lots of cytoplasm and many nuclei um, and a, you would call that a giant cell. There's not one in this one though. So uh, our microscopic description of this case number two said that we see several amorphous pieces of tissue with chronic granulomatous inflammation and lipid vacuoles. Acute inflammation with neutrophils and, and process was also present. So chalasia. Chalasia occur when the meibomian glands, either because of inflammation or because of thickened meibomian gland secretions, are blocked from excreting. The lipid from those glands then leaches into the surrounding tissue and your body doesn't like lipid that 
that's not contained within a cell. And so then your body responds to that with lipogranulomatous inflammation. It is, they are more prominent in the upper lid than the lower lid. And because of this, um, no pain and redness are typically present. So um, this can be one distinguishing feature of more of an acute sty from a Shalazian. We can be conservative in our approach to Shalazia because they do generally present in a very typical fashion. Um, I did read a uh, report by Gawala and Lee, and they compared three methods of Shalazian treatment. One, which was intralesional triamcinolone, one which was incision and curatage, which is what we did, um, and then the use of hot compresses. And what they found is both the triamcinolone and the incision curatage had high rates of cure uh, with the first treatment, up to about 85% uh, cured with the first treatment. Uh, the warm compresses actually had a 46% cure with the uh, first treatment. So although that's half of the success rate of actually like doing something more invasive, it does tell you that um, about half of these will resolve on their own with very conservative therapy. Um, we do a lot more incision and curatage at our institution than we do injections, although ejections are efficient and less invasive. Um, they can be um, useful for patients who are uh, allergic to uh, injected anesthetics. They can be useful for multiple lesions or lesions that are just kind of more diffuse, a little less um, uh, amenable to that curatage. Um, and they can be uh, certainly used both uh, singly and in conjunction with incision and curatage in recurrent lesions. Now let's talk about recurrent lesions because recurrent lesions can be due to sebaceous carcinoma. So this is our bad guy. Um, sebaceous carcinoma can also arise in uh, the glands of Zeiss and meibomian glands. And it can be mistaken for Shalazia, but in fact, it can also cause Shalazia. So sebaceous carcinoma, we think of it presenting in one of three different ways. The first way would be a tumor nodule, like we might see with a basal cell carcinoma or something. The second is a recurrent Shalazian, and that's because of sebaceous cell carcinoma's tendency to, um, to undergo pagetoid spread. So to invade the epithelium, go down into those glands, block the openings of the glands, and cause what looks to be an actual Shalazian. And then the third is because again, the pagetoid spread, um, it can just look like uh, uh, unilateral chronic blepharitis with no uh, distinct lesion and no Shalazian. The uh, di differential diagnosis for Shalazian is kind of like Shalazian, 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 but then there are other rare things other than sebaceous carcinoma that can be um, mistaken for a Shalazian. So Merkel cell tumor, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, keratoacanthoma, epithelial inclusion cysts or tarsal inclusion cysts. Oftentimes um, that would be probably the number one confusing thing with a Shalazian. Pyogenic granuloma preceptal cellulitis for those more diffuse Shalazia, and more commonly abroad than in the U.S., a tubercle, so mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, in fact, when I wanted to teach you all something new about Shalazia, I did a PubMed search to see if there's any new treatments or anything like that, and what I found was not really new treatments. People are sticking with those old-fashioned treatments, but I did find that the most often things published about Shalazia in the last year are these other tumors masquerading as Shalazia. So the first one is a basal cell carcinoma. Um, the second one was primary eyelid tuberculosis. 
uh, delayed treatment of an endocrine mucin producing sweat gland carcinoma, that's my favorite tumor, um, was initially diagnosed as a Shalazian. And then a rare masquerade of Shalazian, it was an adenoid cystic carcinoma. So lots of different things. And so you have to really be wary. You have to keep a differential in your head, even when it looks just like your average Shalazian. Okay. So our third presentation here, a 65-year-old woman presented with a lesion on the right lower eyelid. It had been present for 15 years and was increasing in size. The lesion caused irritation and itching. It was fairly large, five by 3.5 millimeters. It was adjacent to the lateral commissure. I'll show you a picture of it and appeared cystic. So she underwent excision of this lesion. Here you can see the lesion right here at the lateral commissure. Um, and here you can see the histophotomicrograph of this lesion. Now let's just talk about these uh, little cystic lesions. Um, they do appear on the eyelids frequently. We tend to see them at the lateral campus and at the medial campus even more often than on the eyelid margin or near the eyelid margin itself. But here you can see the specimen. So this is again skin. We know that because it's covered with stratified squamous keratinizing epithelium. In the dermis, we've got this large cystic cavity. And again, we can see that is lined also by epithelium and it looks empty. If we zoom in a little bit on that epithelium, we see that it's a bilayer of cells here, um, creating this lining, we can see that there's not maturation like we might see with stratified squamous keratinizing epithelium. Um, we do see that a few of these cells tend to have these little projections off the surface, apical snouts. Um, and so this is an apocrine hydrosystema. And again, just to drive home those salient uh, points, um, we've got that skin with the dermis containing a large cystic space lined with double layer epithelium um, exhibiting the apical snouts. So benign cystic cutaneous lesions around the lids, um, basically um, divided into two different categories, hydrocystomas and then uh, epidermoid or epidermal inclusion cysts. Uh, hydrocystomas are caused by blockage of a sweat duct. They are soft, smooth, fluctuant, and filled with watery fluid. And oftentimes our surgeons, when they, before they've sent these in clinic, will use a transilluminator and try to transilluminate and actually just show that this is actually filled with fluid. The cysts are often multilocular. Their lumina appear empty and contain granular eosinophilic materials. Sometimes they're even pigmented. Sometimes you can get hydrocystomas that have either bled or just contain some pigmented material um, and form this little uh, kind of black purplish nodule. And two types are present, apocrine, um, with apical snouts present and eccrine with no snouts present. Now epidermal uh, inclusion cysts or epidermoid cysts are round unilocular cysts um, and they are filled with a cheesy foul smelling keratin debris. So you don't mistake that for kind of the watery contents of a hydrocystoma. They're lined with keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium. So it looks much like the skin surface. And I'll show you a picture. Um, and the epithelial lining has no epidermal appendages, contra contrasting a dermoid cyst, which is a hamartoma, which is gonna have epithelium with dermal appendages. Multiple epidermoid cysts could indicate Gardner's syndrome. Gardner's syndrome is a variant of familial adenomatous polyposis, FAP. It's an autosomal dominant disease characterized by GI polyps, multiple osteomas, and skin and soft tissue tumors. The findings include epidermoid cysts of the head and neck, 
I um, found most of them are kind of uh, along the jawline, um, but certainly can be near the lids. And these polyps in the colon actually have 100% risk of malignant transformation. So this is an important thing to catch. And so when you would see a patient who has what looks like just a plain old epidermoid cyst, it's not bad to ask about colon cancer screening and family history of colon cancer. And here's that epidermal inclusion cyst. So again, you can see we don't have any skin surface here. We just have the dermis surrounding the cystic structure. We do have uh, stratified squamous keratinizing epithelium here. And you can see that we've got um, keratin in the uh, cyst here. So it looks different than the empty cyst. It's flaky keratin within there, and that's the stuff that smells so bad. Okay, so once again, bread and butter. To many, that might mean mundane, the everyday, the simple stuff. Um, my fellows in the past used to joke around and call themselves like chalaziologists and seborrheic keratologists. They, they, they like to, to tease me. But I hope that you've learned that uh, these three diagnoses and bread, sourdough bread, isn't always so simple. But in my opinion, and the opinion of my family that devoured this loaf of bread in one day, it's worth it. Uh, to conclude, I'd like to thank the fellows in my lab, Meg Nakonda, Christopher Scheifer, and Kenny Taylor, who helped uh, take some pictures and put together some presentation uh, materials for this. Max Winglar, who uh, added the fancy um, flourishes uh, of animation. Hannah Baker, who's just amazing in helping to coordinate this webinar, and then Arpan Gandhi, our humble moderator. So Arpan has not said much about himself, but I wanted to let you know a little bit about Dr. Gandhi. He heads the Shroff's Charity Eye Hospital Eye Pathology Service, both in Delhi and at the secondary locations. He expanded that lab's scope to over 220 services and tests. He's worked with both industry in consulting and leading large and medium-sized endeavors and writing. So he's written for medical forums. He's written for journals and healthcare sections of large newspapers. So thank you, Dr. Gandhi, for um, having us all here today. We've got a great attendance, and I'm looking forward to learning from our next two speakers. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heather, for the very kind words and an excellent presentation. I loved your pictures, and I kept looking at them, and really <laughs> nice. These are very, really good. So I'm just going to make it a little interesting because I think we are running a little short on time. I'm just going to have a poll here for a few questions. So can you stop sharing, please, Dr. Heather? Uh, yep, I'm, I'm getting there. Let's okay, see. Sure. Here we go. All righty. Yeah. So we have four questions. And I'll request everybody to please answer them on the poll. We have a different way of doing this. Dr. Potter, could you read out the question in the different options for response? Stop share. Sure, Hannah. How are people supposed to respond to this? Do so they you just can click just, on the You can them? just uh, press on the chat box. It's okay. Okay, great. So, 
So which of the following is not a feature of seborrheic keratosis? Number one, clubbing and elongation of the reedy pegs. So I think it's A and B. B, pigmentation of the basal cell layer. C, pseudohorn cysts. D, acanthotic epithelium. Or E, mild, chronic, non-granulomatous inflammation. Again. Dr. Heather, would you like to read out the second question? Sure. This is a photo of what pathologic finding? A, somoma body. B, pseudohorn cyst. C, keratin pearl. D, granuloma. E, folliculitis. often termed as a lesser trellis sign can be associated with all of the following except GI, colon cancer, leukemia, lymphomas, melanoma, or squamous cell carcinoma. So you guys, Dr. Arpan, yes. Dr. Arpan, your video is cutting out. Uh, Dr. Potter, would you please go ahead and just answer the first two questions with the the response with the correct answer? Sure. So all of the following were associated with seborrheic keratoses: pigmentation of the basal cell layer, pseudohorn cysts acanthotic epithelium, and mild chronic non-granulomatous inflammation. The one that was not associated with seborrheic keratosis is clubbing and elongation of the reedy pegs. You see bridging of the reedy pegs, but not necessarily clubbing and elongation, which is more of a finding in psoriasis. Number two, this is a photo of which of the following? That is a photo of pseudohorn cysts. Again, you can see the connection with the surface epithelium. Do you want me to you want go, ahead and go ahead and proceed, Dr. Potter, to three and four. Thank you. Sure. So multiple, multiple seborrheic keratosis, often termed the lesser trilot sign, can be associated with all of the following except. So it can be associated with GI and colon cancer, leukemia, lymphoma, and squamous cell carcinoma. It is not associated, not a sign of melanoma. Sebaceous carcinoma can be diagnosed with which stain? Oil red O. Now I can tell you that nowadays we're not doing oil red O, we're using immunohistochemistry, but it is kind of an old fashioned thought about using oil red O. And some, um, some people still like to ask that question. And so I wanted to make sure you would all know the answer. Thank, thank you, Dr. Heather. I'm just gonna stop share screen. And I would like to introduce Maxwell. Maxwell, can you please? Share your screen while I introduce you. So Maxwell, Absolutely. Yep. Yes. I'm giving it right now here. So Maxwell is our chief is the chief president at the University of Wisconsin, and he plans to do his fellowship in the vitroretinal department. His research interests are retinal toxicity, inherited retinal diseases, white dot syndrome, and pain reduction due to intravitreal injections. He recently published a very interesting re case report on retinal toxicity with l a commonly used medication to treat bladder pain syndrome. So we're delighted to have Maxwell as part of our teaching endeavor and he's over to him. Thank you, Maxwell. All right, well, thank you very much, Dr. Gandhi. And thanks everyone for attending. It really does go to show, I think I saw at least 85 people here. So what a broad reach that our specialty has, even across the globe. Um, I hope you all are doing very well in this uh, trying time, and thanks for joining us this morning. Um, I'm going to have to be a little efficient in my talk because I have some post-ops coming. 
um, upstairs, but uh, still I'm gonna give you a good run through here. Um, so can you all see my screen okay? Just to make sure. Yes, we can, yes, we can see yes. it. Okay, all right, perfect. Okay, we'll get started here. So my topic is brain bleeds and blurry vision. So part of the, the blood, part of the bit of blood and thunder of our presentation this morning. Um, I have no disclosures and I just threw a couple of photos from my personal collection um, of just handheld fundus photography. Um, the goals of the talk, we're gonna present a, a brief case here, discuss some common causes for retinal hemorrhages and their clinical relevance to pathology, and then also present some pathology uh, images alongside this case with um, hopefully avid discussion. So kind of moving along the case, we have a 55-year-old female with a chief concern of blurred vision in both eyes. Uh, actually began about two months ago, and she unfortunately had a history of a subarachnoid hemorrhage that occurred after she had a ruptured basal or tip aneurysm, and she subsequently underwent endovascular coiling and posterior fossa decompression to evacuate the blood uh, with neurosurgery. So it was a fairly extensive procedure with, with a uh, prolonged ICU stay. Um, she said she first noticed this blurry vision two months ago when she was extubated, actually. Um, and overall, it's gotten a little better in the right eye, but stayed the same in the left. Um, again, we mentioned that history of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. She has no, no diabetes, does have a little bit of hypertension, a little bit myopic, but not a huge ocular history here. Um, and no big social cues to in any one direction. But she does take Plavix, um, so the blood thinner there to prevent another clot. Um, and then also has some allergies we've noted there. Um, so we'll do a little bit of Friday thinking here, like our pal in the picture. Um, so what could be a differential just on this brief history? Um, to keep it broad, and keep our thinking caps on. We have a Valsalva retinopathy. She was just extubated. She noticed that blurry vision after she extubated. As we know, extubation can be a fairly uh, Valsalva inducing process. Um, dry eye, we always keep that on the differential before um, when we hear blurry vision. Um, Vitreous hemorrhage is also possible. She's on a blood thinner, hypertensive retinopathy, did have some uh, high pressures in the ICU. Um, Tursen syndrome, um, she had a subarachnoid hemorrhage and now she has blurry vision. That's one thing. Um, perchers and perchers like retinopathy, although more associated with trauma, but still something to consider. A traumatic optic neuropathy um, from this ruptured aneurysm, it's possible, but something to consider. And then a posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. She was on the operative table with neurosurgery for about five hours for the operative note. And uh, she was in the supine position, but she was rotated. But still, long-term uh, supine positioning, especially in cardiac procedures, if you get this pull out of the way, sorry, um, can cause uh, some deprivation of blood and a posterior ischemic optic neuropathy is possible. Um, so here's her exam. She's 21, 25 in the right, and does pinhole a little better, uh, 2400 in the left. Kind of an eccentric uh, fixation for uh, for that vision though, not centrally, she doesn't really see well. Um, no APD, reactive pupils, pressures are fine. She actually could see good peripherally, but centrally she noted a little bit more blurriness. She was able to count fingers though without too much issue. Um, although her color vision was interestingly uh, decreased in both eyes without a history of any congenital color blindness. She's a female too. Um, a little bit of a cataract, which um, not totally atypical here. Um, and uh, overall, fairly clear view to the back through the vitreous. Um, so then we talk about the posterior segment exam. We see some hemorrhages, um, kind of more on the pre-retinal distribution, and then this kind of dehemoglobinized area in this ring of blood. I'll show you some pictures in just a second. Um, and then the left eye demonstrating a little bit more significant hemorrhages uh, with this large hemorrhage along the superior arcade and diffuse dot blots uh, seen as well. Um, this was her initial OCT. Now, mind you, she presented to us about two months after um, she experienced this blurry vision. So the, the process has already started and probably began resolving at this point, but you can almost, you can already see this um, uh, large sub ILM hemorrhage here causing some hypotransmission effect. And then if you look closely, you can see the ILM right there, which is kind of an interesting finding with the right and left eyes respectively. And this is a radial OCT that with the uh, Heidelberg. Um, Here's the Optos uh, fundus photography. This is the right eye with a wide field on the, uh, the left-hand side of your view. And then a zoomed in photo, more of the, uh, the macular focus. On the left-hand side, you can see more of this kind of just large dot blot hemorrhage by the superior arcade, uh, somewhat indistinct border of the disc without cl uh, any classic clear um, disc edema. But then this large, almost ring-like 
area of uh, hemorrhage with dehemoglobinized blood in the center, and then also some resolving hemorrhage, which appears quite deep because you can see this vessel running over it as well. So that kind of speaks to the layers as this, this hemorrhage here is obscuring the vessel, which we kind of saw in OCT. Here's the, oops, here's the left eye, same thing, a little bit more peripheral kind of dot hemes extending off as we talked about the superior arcade. And again, this dehemoglobinized blob with this ring of blood, almost a little bit more distinct, not quite as large as the other eye, but it almost obscuring the fovea entirely. And this was her eccentric fixation eye um, overall. Uh, so for her clinical course, just to keep this case brief, because I can talk about this for a while, but we actually um, elected to observe her after we discussed options, including um, hemorrhage removal, vitrectomy, but the, I mean, her vitreous overall was clear. It was more sub-ILM. Um, and with observation and uh, a follow-up six weeks later, she actually had some improvement. So without pinhole, now 2080, and then 2200 in the left eye. And again, we discussed options with her and she elected to follow up again and just give it some more tincture of time, which oftentimes can be helpful in this case. Um, and then eight weeks later showed continued improvement. Um, here is um, some of our final fundus photography. It's amazing what the body can do. Um, so right eye, um, actually here on the left hand, um, well, yeah, left hand side, and then right eye over here, or left eye over here. We can see that hemorrhage that was kind of obscuring her fovea is now gone. And again, in the right eye, you have these more peripheral findings here, but overall just some remnant dot plots, but the body's done a good job of getting rid of that kind of double ring of blood. Um, and she was now 2025 20, with these photos, um, although she did say it was quite a bit blurry still, but it was still, she was able to read the line without too much difficulty. Um, and here's just to show the 2025 OCT, that hemorrhage has now cleared. You have this little pocket of um, sub ILM space, and there's also maybe a little bit of remnant hemorrhage here, and then the left eye showing a larger pocket. And if we look kind of along this outer retinal layers, there, there may be some outer retinal atrophy and loss, and that could be from longstanding uh, hemorrhage, which can overall be toxic to the retina if it's in the deeper layers. Um, but she was, again, seeing 2025 20, without any surgical intervention. Um, so overall, uh, a fairly positive outcome in this case. Um, so what did she have? She had uh, what we call Tursen or Tursen syndrome, um, which is commonly described in cases where people have um, subarachnoid and sometimes subdural hemorrhages caused by often cerebral aneurysms, which in her case, she had a basal or tip aneurysm rupture, uh, head trauma, which oftentimes in head trauma, you also think of perchers and perchers like retinopathy, elevated ICP tumors and other intracranial hemorrhage causes. And the reason I kept mentioning this double ring sign is because that's almost classic for this finding. There was a, um, a paper uh, back in 2005 in um, one of the British Journals of Ophthalmology that talks about this double ring sign where it's a combination of a subhyloid overlying a sub um, internal limiting membrane hemorrhage, which gives you this almost ring of blood sign. And then you also get these uh, hemorrhages, which can be distributed through the vitreous, the hyaloid, intraretinal, and then sub ILM for this Tursten syndrome. And it's thought to be caused by this rapid increase in intracranial pressure, which forces um, this pressure to be transmitted down the optic nerve sheath swells the optic nerve and causes a uh, occlusion of the choroidal anastomosis and leads to bleeding. Now there's also a thought that um, there can be direct transmission of blood uh, along the optic nerve um, just in the subarachnoid space and then cause the blood to just diffuse out of the peripapillary margin into the, um, the retina itself. And it, the important thing for us as ophthalmologists, um, as we are oftentimes the only ones that can kind of see these things, are Patients with uh, Tursen syndrome or subarachnoid hemorrhage combined with retinal hemorrhage have a way or a significantly higher morbidity and mortality. Studies were done and it's as low as, well, three to nine times higher than just a person with a subarachnoid hemorrhage in terms of poor outcomes and, uh, and worse uh, clinical course and even mortality uh, rates were much higher. And this has been studied in numerous case reports. Um, and another important thing to keep in mind is this can have a delayed onset. Um, there's the farthest case report I found in the literature showed that uh, hemorrhage occurring from subarachnoid hemorrhage occurred as far out as 47 days after the initial um, intracranial hemorrhage. So something to keep in mind if you see subarachnoid on uh, their medical chart and you're following them up in your clinic. Um, 
And then now we're getting to some pathology here. So these are um, pathologic slides or histopath slides taken from patients with Tursen syndrome. Um, I like the, this, we'll start with two, because it kind of demonstrates the layers of the retina. And we see kind of in this outer plexiform layer, these foci of hemorrhages. And these are more deeper in the retina. And you'd expect these to be more dot blocks. There's more organization in these layers. So they're more contained. Whereas if you get more superficial by ILM and things like that, they tend to be more diffuse and spread out. Um, this photo shows some vitreous hemorrhage here, 4A. Um, 4B is showing some, um, some subhyloid hemorrhage here, and then also just some, uh, some, a little bit of neurofiber layer hemorrhage. And then there's some deeper hemorrhage. And I really like uh, this photo, 9D, which also kind of argues to that other, oh, that keeps popping out, this pathologic, um, other pathologic uh, thought on why Tursen syndrome develops of hemorrhage tracking right along the subarachnoid space. And then you can imagine it almost coming out at this peripapillary margin as it kind of moves along there and it's demonstrated on both sides. And then this 4C is kind of a cool photo too. This is a gross specimen showing this subhyloid hemorrhage almost emanating from this area in this, if you can imagine the spider web like pattern, but it's still in contained in that subhyloid space. So if you did a B scan, you can almost get fooled in seeing this, this line and then having this amorphous substance under it. And like, gosh, what is that? But that's just that subhyloid hemorrhage. I mean, I've seen a numerous amount of patients like that on call too. Um, so kind of a good gross specimen of that. I often find that it's, it's nice to start from the thousand foot up view here and then kind of look deeper at the slides and seeing what the story tells us. So we'll keep moving forward here. So other causes of retinal hemorrhage as ophthalmologists, important things to keep in mind. And this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but still. Um, most commonly and more commonly what I've been seeing lately are trauma and non-accidental trauma cases, anemia, thrombocytopenia, infection, inflammation, blood dyscrasias like um, leukemias, Fanconi anemia, diamond black fan syndrome, all these other um, blood abnormalities can cause that. Tumors, connective tissue diseases, um, Coats disease, ROP, BRVO, CRV of the blood and thunder as we get back to that. Um, wet AMD causing the neovascularization and retinal tears also can cause retinal hemorrhages, especially if they tear through a vessel. Um, and then we kind of move along. This is a busy slide. I don't expect you to read it all, but I do love the fact that it has this nice histopath slide of all the retinal layers and showing you lights pathway as it works its way down just from that top internal limiting membrane all the way down to the beautiful choroid here. And this is an important thing to keep in mind because we can localize hemorrhages based on what layer of the retina they're in and we can have a little diagram to help. So if we see a hemorrhage boom in the nerve fiber layer, that's gonna be a what? A flame hemorrhage. So we have our little flame to remember that. We get a little bit deeper and you can almost see that these layers are more organized as you get down towards the layers of the rods and cones, the outer plexiform, inner nuclear layers. And we expect to see a dot, a dot hemorrhage because those layers are more, um, structurally intact, the architecture is more intact and will contain that hemorrhage a little bit better. However, if you get kind of sub-RPE or sub-retinal pigment epithelium, the hemorrhage can be more diffuse. You can have these submacular hemorrhages that kind of spread out a little bit more. So, but these central layers, you'll have a more well-defined circular type hemorrhage. So you can think it's more of a deeper process going at play and they tend to spread more as they're um, more superficial. And you can even look at this nerve fiber layer and see how it's more of a feathery like appearance. Um, and that's the kind of glaucoma hemorrhage you can often see too. Um, and then also appearance, as I said, can help with localization. This is a photo of a patient with um, AML acute myeloid leukemia. And uh, he actually had hemorrhages and with uh, flame hemorrhages as well as dot hemorrhages. And you can localize them here. We're looking at the nerve fiber layer. We see hemorrhage isolated with these black arrows. That's our flame, hemorrhage, feathery appearance, more superficial. We get deeper, we see almost like you could draw a circle around these with these red arrows here. And you can see how this structure is a little more organized. That's your dot hemorrhage, dot for deeper, um, at least how I remember it. But that's just keeping in mind that this helps with localization. Um, and then continuing with the theme here, non-accidental trauma also presents with both brain bleeds and blurry vision retinal hemorrhage. Um, although our patients often can't tell us that, but our role is critical as ophthalmologists because it can be both a specific and sensitive finding in non-accidental trauma. So we play an integral role in the process of workup of non-accidental trauma. Um, also important, if you see macular hemorrhage obscuring the fo fovea, that child is now at risk for amblyopia. So we need to consider early intervention to 
depending on the age and the extent of hemorrhage. And this requires extremely close clinical follow-up because we don't want to have this child have a bad outcome just because of this. Um, and then keep in mind that cases of NAT have about 80% involvement for retinal hemorrhages. And that's just due to this um, coup contra coup shear force of the shaken baby syndrome, shearing those retinal blood vessels as the, the layers are just loosely adherent, they can easily shear and cause diffuse hemorrhages in all three layers of the retina, demonstrated as you see by a rather advanced case here. Um, this is actually from, um, from the University of Iowa in their eye rounds uh, table, but all these hemorrhages kind of in all three layers and you see almost this Roth spot appearance. And this you can truly say is too numerous to count. Um, and then another gross specimen, just because I find these fascinating, and this was actually from uh, my time with uh, Dr. Potter in the pathology lab. We grossed in a, a non-accidental trauma case of a patient unfortunately passed away. Um, but this was an eight-week-old uh, little baby, and you can see hemorrhages kind of diffusely here, some dot hemes, and then some emanating actually from the nerve itself. Um, and this is kind of the, the gross specimen here with the retina kind of folded up on itself as well. Um, and then these are photos also from Dr. Path, uh, Potter's pathology lab with NAT cases that we have in the teaching file set, as well as um, one from that poor baby that we just saw. But hemorrhage is represented in all layers of the retina. And then this one's interesting because you see hemorrhage tracking actually into the nerve. So this is the optic nerve tissue and there's hemorrhage right there. Um, and then you can see that demonstrated as well on this slide at the very bottom um, right hand portion of your screen tracking around the peripapillary margin and they also have a little retinal detachment too. Um, and then one more time to hit that blood and thunder. This is a central retinal vein occlusion. Um, a ton of blood just on this photo here. This is from an article by Gupta et al. They did an excellent review of retinal anatomy and pathology um, back in 2015. And these are some shots taken from that. Um, this is a fluorescene showing the dilated retinal vessels, extremely dilated veins blocking from the hemorrhage. And then um, you can see just how extensive this involves and it's definitely a central process. Um, bottom left with the yellow arrow, this is a Mason trichrome stain which typically stains the nuclei. And you can see actually demonstrated by the yellow arrow, the thrombus, which is the culprit for this process here at play. And then we shift over to the bottom right, you see this red arrow. This is a little tuft of neovascularization, which we do have to watch carefully for in our patients that develop central retinal and branch retinal vein occlusions. Um, and then just because I find this is one of my favorite path texts just for rapid review for board study and things like that. This is the Albert and Azari ocular pathology case review. And this is a nice just on fast view of a, a central retinal vein occlusion as well, demonstrating that classic blood and thunder appearance. And then showing us the layers with hemorrhage demonstrated in all layers of the retina. Um, kind of deeper here, you see these dot hemorrhages and then our flame hemorrhages in the nerve fiber layer. And you can almost draw them, appreciate a flame-like appearance coming off this disc margin here. Um, and so that's pretty much uh, the details of my talk. A couple more cool photos just from my uh, time with Dr. Potter. This is Somering's ring cataract on an IOL. Uh, so that's kind of fascinating to see that just in a gross specimen with a view of the pars plana. And then you see here on the right hand side, geographic atrophy in a patient with advanced AMV. Um, and then also some PRP scars in the periphery too, uh, which is kind of interesting. And then just to touch on those uh, those photos I had at the beginning, just I use this app all the time. If you don't have a fundus camera and you're seeing inpatients with a, your phone and a 20 diopter lens and some dilating drops, you can get nice, crisp, clear photos with this free app designed by Dr. Michael Allman, um, who was previously at uh, um, Georgetown. And I think now he's doing his corneal fellowship at Wash U, but I'm not 100% sure on that second part. Maybe he's in Gainesville, but he designed this free app and it's, it's an awesome tool to have in your arsenal as you're rounding and checking on inpatients, especially if you need to follow up on like an endophthalmitis process or a fungal chorioretinitis. Um, so that's pretty much what I have for you this morning. Um, thanks for letting me take time to talk your ear off a little bit. And I, I really do appreciate everyone tuning in across the globe. Um, and uh, thanks for the care that you're providing for your patients. Um, I'm sure they all appreciate you very much. Um, yeah, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Maxwell. That was excellent. You deserve, yes, the, Dr. Sarah gave you a round of applause. That's the right thing to do. Uh, and I really well, like you. the way you showed the ocular histopathology picture. That's always a plus plus coming from a from a clinician. Thank you so much. So I'm going to go Absolutely. to Dr. Farooz. Um, she's been waiting very 
very, very patiently. And uh, thank you, Professor Feroz. Um, she is a very well-known oculoplastic orbit and ocular oncologist in India. She heads the Horus. She's the director at the Horus Speciality Eye Care Bangalore. And I, I just have to tell her, can you please be present for my webinar? And she'll say, okay, the to tell me the topic. And then before I can decide, she's so she's always very, very cooperative and always I'm very, very comfortable with having her and also learning from her. And she, as you can see, she's also a, a retinoblastoma specialist at the Women and Children's Hospital at Gyeongdong. I don't know how, if I pronounce that right in China. So, oh, uh, and she's got the AAO Best Award in 2011, 14, 15, 16, 17. And if that wasn't enough, she was. She also got the award for the International Hero at the AIOS in 2018. Her future goals are very interesting. And I think all of us should follow the three L's, live, love, and laugh. So over to Dr. Farooz. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. I hope I'm audible and my slides are visible. Yes, both. Yes to both. Yeah, hi. So uh, greetings and namaste from India to all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arpan, once again for this invitation and inclusion in this fantastic webinar where uh, you know it's an honor to be able to share the screen with the renowned uh, ophthalmologists and pathologists uh, from different parts of the world. Thank you very much uh, once again. So I'm going to talk about my favorite topic, that's retinoblastoma. I have no financial disclosures or interest. And before I start my talk, thanks to all these little warriors whom we celebrate every day, uh, from whom we have learned many a lessons, and my wonderful team uh, of, uh, you know, who helps me uh, in the management of retinoblastoma, including the medical oncologist, the radiation oncologist, the pathologist, and the geneticist. Thanks to everyone for making this journey really, really beautiful. So I'm going to talk about the progress, uh, the leap of progress in the management of retinoblastoma. But in order to know uh, how we have progressed and what are the advancements, it's very important to know where we started. So it was Peter Poe in the 15th century who actually uh, identified a tumor which was very similar to retinoblastoma and first to report in the literature. And it was rediscovered by Hirschberg and uh, uh, Hirschberg in the 19th century, where you can see this is what exactly what he has written, an enormous tumor in the eye with thick blood and like crushed stone. Probably it could be the calcification of the retinoblastoma that he was mentioning. So uh, in fact, uh, the evolution of retinoblastoma revolved around uh, many and numerous legends uh, in the field of ophthalmology, pathology, and molecular researchers. Uh, who in fact, uh, whose contribution is extremely uh, valuable uh, during that time and even in the present time in uh, various management protocols that we follow. And all this happened during the 18th century. So it was uh, uh, Dr. James Wardrow who actually uh, defined uh, the term retinoblastoma. And he in fact introduced enucleation as a treatment of uh, retinoblastoma in the 18th century. But of course, there were lots of objection because it was a crude technique then, uh, being the fact that it was before the era of introduction of chloroform by Simpson, and it was considered to be a very, very crude procedure. But later, it was definitely uh, embraced and accepted as a primary management of retinoblastoma in the 18th century. In the 18th century, Von Graffe has identified the extension, the optic nerve extension of retinoblastoma. And he, in fact, advised the correct technique of enucleation with long optic nerve stem, which in fact, all of us follow very strictly at this point of time in the 20th century. So uh, the enucleation outcome in the 18th century was not impressive. So the survival was reported to be 5% by Hirschberg and 57% by Leber. So we, in fact, uh, there was a need for something more in order to improve the outcome in retinoblastoma. And it was at that time that X-ray was introduced as a mode of uh, irradiation to retinoblastoma by Dr. Hill Gartner in Texas. Well, many researchers and many clinicians, again, accepted uh, external beam radiotherapy 
as a mode of management of retinoblastoma. So it was Mark J. Schoenberg who actually reported the first case of a scar tissue sarcoma in a patient who got radiated in 1919 and 1944. That is 25 years later, he reported a scar tissue sarcoma. And then the radiation induced secondary malignancy was identified and subsequently external beam radiation in retinoblastoma was discouraged and almost discontinued as a primary management. In fact, retinoblastoma, the term was coined by Berhoff and it was accepted by the American Ophthalmological Society in the 1926. Due to the associated systemic side effects of external beam radiotherapy, Henry B. Stallard, who's also an Olympian, who participated in the Paris Olympics, he introduced cobalt-60 plaque brachytherapy as a management modality in retinoblastoma. Well, it was Dr. Karl Kupfer initially who introduced systemic chemotherapy along with radiation, and that was nitrogen mustard, which was used at that point of time in order to improve the outcome of retinoblastoma. We do see these children in their teens and who are in their late. 20s even now, who has undergone immunization and radiation with a very high risk of secondary systemic malignancy. And well, and this is how their outcome of cosmos is with severely contracted sockets. So we really needed a different uh, uh, advancement in the management of retinoblastoma, which can save life, which can possibly save vision and uh, also eyes in these patients. So 1990 was a revolution in evolution. And why do I call it? This actually was the changing phase in the management of retinoblastoma with the introduction of systemic intravenous chemotherapy by various clinical researchers. As you can see, the list is here. Dr. Shields, Dr. Murphy, Dr. Galley, Dr. Ferris, everyone came together and introduced this systemic intravenous chemotherapy protocol when Christine, etoposide, and carboplatin as the primary management of retinoblastoma, which is in fact used as a primary management modality in most of the third world countries where financial constraints are a major issue. So systemic chemotherapy has certain advantages so first and foremost, it actually helps in life salvage, which is very, very important because there can be a situation where the eyes, although it is an intraocular tumor, but it can have uh, a high risk of systemic micrometastasis. In fact, eye salvage has improved with systemic chemotherapy. Vision salvage has also improved with systemic chemotherapy. So I'm going to show you a few pictures very quickly because of the time constraint, the outcome of intraocular retinoblastoma with systemic intravenous chemotherapy. So 95% of the patients that I treat in India with a retinoblastoma is systemic chemotherapy. So as you can see here, group A, it's completely regressed, eye salvaged, vision salvaged, and this was a large tumor which was occupying the macula area of the eye. And once it was chemo reduced with application of laser, you can see even the foveola is paired over here with eye salvage, vision salvage. Group C with lots of vitreous seeds, a large tumor, retinal detachment, systemic chemotherapy, eye saved and the vision saved, as well as even in group D, like if it is not a very severe group D, you can even salvage a vision as in this case. But some case of group D, in fact, goes to enucleation as well as in some group E, as you can see here. But when these children doesn't undergo irradiation, and as you can see here, beautiful cosmesis after enucleation as well with a prosthetic eye in these two kids over here. So with the introduction of systemic chemotherapy, we all know that the, there is nearly 100% life salvage if it is detected early and almost more than 98% eye salvage depending upon the group and the stage of the disease. So why is it so important? Why was it so important to uh, uh, you know, uh, find various other modalities uh, in order to save these children? Because we do see around uh, uh, 8,000 uh, children per year worldwide uh, with retinoblastoma. And unfortunately, most of the developing countries and third world countries 
uh, the tumor is mostly advanced when they present in their initial presentation. So it was also noted that 20 to 30 percent of children, even in this era, die despite primary inflation. Why is it so? The risk factors, the histopathological risk factors and identification is very, very important because they can have systemic micrometastasis and high risk of systemic metastasis even after inuclation. So systemic chemotherapy, in fact, again, took care of it in the mode of adjuvant chemotherapy. So I'm going to take you to a slide here. We have very renowned pathologists here along with us. So I'm sure they all agree to this fact. So there are certain histopathological high-risk features, again, which has been identified subsequently which can cause systemic micrometastasis. And these are the histopathological risk features. So none of the eyes that is enucleated goes, you know, un, uh, unexamined. It has to be uh, examined uh, in detail histopathologically, looking for each and every high-risk uh, factors. And if at all it is present, adjuvant chemotherapy in the form of systemic chemotherapy has to be administered. So, well, these are the uh, excellent results uh, where the ch children, although they have uh, uh, high-risk features in histopathology, they undergo adjuvant chemotherapy. The life is saved and they definitely live a happy life. So, 2000 saw a very big leap. Well, and what was the leap in retinoblastoma? It was the introduction of intra-arterial chemotherapy. And who are the brain behind this? It was Dr. Akihiro Kaniko, who initially introduced this wonderful technique of treating retinoblastoma, directly going and treating retinoblastoma uh, uh, with, uh, within the ophthalmic artery. And later, this was popularized in the West into a supra-selective intra-arterial chemotherapy, reducing the uh, local side effects, uh, intraocular side effects of the procedure by Dr. David Abramson. And this has been a very huge leap in the current scenario uh, in the management of retinoblastoma. So intra-arterial chemotherapy, yes, it is also con considered as one of the primary treatment modality of retinoblastoma. So it in fact helps in eye salvage. I'm going to come to the data later especially in advanced tumors as in group D tumors with severe vitreous seeds and also vision salvage. But it doesn't take care of life salvage because this is a very targeted focal chemotherapy where the chemotherapeutic drugs are not given into the body. So what is intra-arterial chemotherapy? It is a direct intraocular delivery of chemotherapeutic agents via the ophthalmic artery. So what is the advantage of intra-arterial chemotherapy? compared to systemic chemotherapy is that there is an increased drug concentration which is attained directly inside the eye, inside the tumor, minimal systemic absorption leading to re reduced systemic side effects and long-term systemic complication can be avoided. So the drugs which is used in intra-arterial chemotherapy is either the triple drug uh, you know, the double drug or even the mono drug. So we have melphalan. The choices are melphalan, topotecan, and carboplatin. So this is a procedure. I'm going to show you a small video, a quick one. So this is for the, uh, you know, the trainees and the residents over here through the femoral artery, through the aorta, internal carotid artery. And this is the ophthalmic artery, which is a branch where the catheter is placed. It's peaked inside. And after you ensure the placement by fluoroscopy, then you inject the chemotherapeutic agents into the catheter, which directly reaches through the artery into the tumor and it treats. So this is how the intra-arterial chemotherapy works. So uh, this was a, a four-month-old child who presented with a large tumor, a group D tumor. Uh, and this is how it was after four sessions of intra-arterial chemotherapy with melphalan and topotecan. So the initial reports uh, uh, were published, uh, the outcomes based on the international classification of retinoblastoma. Uh, it was my work with Dr. Carol Shields, who's my mentor at Bill's Eye Hospital, and it was quite encouraging. So I'm going to take you to the data over here. So we did compare chemo reduction with intra-arterial chemotherapy. So the most strikingly 
was the actually the eye salvage rate of group D eyes. So as you can see here, with chemo reduction, it is reported as 47 percentage, but it really leaped and jumped to 95 percent. This is Dr. Shields' uh, work, and this is my work from China, where the group D eye salvage rate was 85 percent. But group E, yes, we do give if the patients uh, group E. We do give ISC if the patient, I mean, if the parents persist, but the results has not been too encouraging. And this was the youngest child that I treated uh, with intra-arterial chemotherapy. If you ask me how safe it is, yes, it is safe if it is done in an experienced hand and uh, cautiously. So this was a four weeks of age uh, a baby who received intra-arterial chemotherapy in the left eye. And as you can see here, after three sessions, the tumor has completely redressed. But every, every, every procedure has its downfalls as well. So there are certain things that we as ophthalmologists uh, has to be aware of. And this procedure is done, not done by an ocular oncologist. It is actually done by an interventional neuroradiologist or a neurosurgeon. So as an ophthalmologist, we should be really cautious in selecting the cases, very well knowing what could be the ocular complications. So visually devastating complications like choroidal atrophy, vascular thrombosis, CRAO, which is hemorrhage and optic neuropathy has been reported. And although the most common ones are ptosis and lit edema, which resolves spontaneously. So I would like to point out very, very important aspect of intra-arterial chemotherapy here. As you all know, if at all there is in a group E eyes, if there is any clinical risk feature of systemic uh, metastasis, never do IAC because IAC doesn't take care of systemic micrometastasis. So this was a child who actually received IAC initially. I has to be enucleated because as you can see here, there is Bufthalmos and uh, uh, very sad after enucleation, we found that there was optic nerve extension in this uh, child, but the child was saved uh, right on time. So the use of intra-arterial chemotherapy has, be, has to be used with caution. The other challenge that we always faced in the management of retinoblastoma was the vitreous seed. So these are the different protocols that we used before until 2012. Chemo reduction, high dose uh, chemotherapy, periocular carboplatin, etc. And the eye salvage rate has been somewhere around 22% to 77%. So uh, the next leap in the management of retinoblastoma was the introduction of intravitreal chemotherapy. So the initial chemotherapeutic agent that was used was melphalan and later topotecan. So this is how we do it. A pass planar uh, route is adopted into the vitreous, very much away from the vitreous seeds because these seeds are very cohesive. It is very, very important that when you inject and come out, you don't carry these tumor cells in the tumor, uh, in the needle bore, or along the uh, along the needle track, which can lead to extraocular extension. So there are certain safety enhanced technique that we follow after the initial introduction of uh, intravitreal chemotherapy. So we inject very cautiously, then we do cryo, a triple freeze for cryo, at the site of injection in order to uh, prevent any extraocular you know, spread of these tumor cells. And uh, so we actually do the cryo with the needle in position. Uh, so in order to freeze any tumor cells, uh, if, if at all there is a possibility for it to uh, come outside. So the role of intravitreal chemotherapy for retinoblastoma has been discussed. And uh, Dr. Munir was uh, the person who initially introduced the safety enhanced uh, technique and thanks to him. So uh, well, every procedure, as I told you, again, has uh, associated side effects. So it is very, very important to titrate uh, the dosage of uh, the chemotherapeutic agents that you're injecting inside the eye and also as well as uh, uh, the technique. So uh, we did again uh, report our initial uh, reports on the intravitreal melphalan, but if you ask me what is my favorite uh, drug uh, to inject intravitreally, I would say one topotecan, two topotecan, and three topotecan, and that's what I use because the local toxicity compared to melphalan is much, much less. Uh, with topotecan, especially in pigmented eyes, as I deal with in India and China. So as you can see here, this uh, this child, he is uh, quite, uh, he was 13 year old when he uh, came to me 
Uh, so if this eye was the right eye is already enucleated uh, for retinoblastoma. So he has a left eye, the only eye which is uh, salvaged at this point of time, which has already received uh, external beam radiotherapy. And then he presented at 13 years of age with uh, vitreous seeds. And this was a vitreous seeds arising from a small tumor which recurred many, many years back. In fact, like, you know, eight years later after the radiation that he received. So what do we do at this point of time? Uh, so it was mainly vitreous seeds and a tumor which has been there. So I was thinking about any focal therapy which can be given to this child because he's allergic to chemotherapy and that's why they have to abandon chemotherapy and go to external beam radiotherapy for him. So what we did was injection of intravitreal topotecan. This is after four injections. And as you can see here, laser therapy was given to this tumor. So there was complete resolution of vitreous seeds, which was taken care of by intravitreal topotecan. Yet another case with the recurrence. And this is an endophytic recurrence from an already regressed tumor after systemic chemotherapy and laser. Intravitreal topotecan 3 injection, you can see the tumor has regressed. So intravitreal topotecan has various indications. Initially, it started with vitreous seeds. We also use with subretinal seeds and even small endophytic tumors. So this is my uh, data on intravitreal chemotherapy. So uh, 31 eyes were treated and uh, we found uh, regression in almost 100% of the eyes, but there was recurrence and eye salvage was 90%. And this is a paper which has already been published by Rao et al. of 17 eyes with similar reports. So this is basically the uh, leap that we really had in salvaging these eyes. And intravitreal chemotherapy, I would like to stress again, it is not a primary management of treatment, it is an adjuvant management of treatment for vitreous seeds, subretinal seeds. So this was a child, uh, I'm coming to the last, uh, you know, later slides of my presentation, a six-year-old child who presented with a white reflex in the right eye. So the father really wanted to save her eye. And this was how the intraocular picture looked like. As you can see here, a large tumor arising inferiorly. The entire vitreous is filled with seeds. And as you can see here, there is a ciliary body tumor also involved over here. So what we did was uh, uh, six cycles of systemic chemotherapy, intravitreal uh, chemotherapy, periocular uh, uh, topotecan and plug bracket therapy in this case for the ciliary body tumor. So this is basically a multimodal approach when we are actually uh, you know desperate in salvaging the eye in certain situations. Not in all cases but you have to take a right decision so that you don't actually cause a risk to life. So this is how this child was treated with systemic chemo, periocular topo, intravitreal topo, and plug bracket therapy. And why was this done? Because she had a wonderful eye with good fovea and optic nerve. So this had a good vision salvage as well. So next is uh, the most challenging part of the management of retinoblastoma are these advanced cases where the tumor has spread outside the confines of the eyeball into the orbit. So the, with the introduction of intensive multimodal treatment protocol, I'm uh, proud to say that my mentor and teacher, Dr. Santosh Unava, introduced this treatment protocol in uh, orbital retinoblastoma, which we all follow with high-dose chemotherapy, followed by enucleation after radiological, after confirmation of radiological regression of the orbital component of the tumor, followed by external beam radiotherapy, and then we complete uh, uh, the chemo with uh, 12 cycles. So we call it intensive multimodal treatment protocol to salvage life in these children. So one case where this child presented with a large tumor coming out of uh, into the orbit and extending almost up to the posterior part of uh, the apex. And this is post chemotherapy three where the eye has completely regressed into a thysical eye post enucleation and radiotherapy, the child seems comfortable. So in a study of 40 patients, uh, we found that multimodal treatment protocol has a survival rate of 90%. So that's definitely a big leap in the management of retinoblastoma as far as life salvage is concerned. So this is uh, my conclusion slides. Uh, so the primary management of retinoblastoma, in fact, uh, which improved uh, uh, life, uh, life salvage, vision salvage, and 
uh, I salvage a systemic chemotherapy, intra-arterial chemotherapy, and enucleation when the adjuvant treatments like intravitreal, periocular, and transpupillary chemotherapy and cryotherapy also has aided in uh, improving the outcome in these children. So we all need to know that retinoblastoma is a curable eye cancer. So, and it is also very important to identify the risk versus benefit of all primary management in order to choose uh, the right treatment protocol. So again, management goals is always life salvage, eye salvage and vision salvage. Although the newer treatment modalities is definitely a huge leap in the progress of management of retinoblastoma, it has to be used with caution. And well, of course, there are various uh, advancements in the field of genetics. Probably I may not be able to cover due to the limitation of time, maybe next time. So thank you very much. And as ocular oncologist and retinoblastoma specialist, our effort has always been to save life, I envision, in these tiny thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farooz. That was really nice. Wonderful, detailed. Thank you. And thank you for saving and improving the quality of so many children. I mean, it's wonderful that the picture of your second slide with so many pictures of so many children was just remarkable. Thank so you. I'd like to thank everybody because I think I've made everybody late. And this has made, made everybody late in different parts of the world. So that's something I'm, I'm sorry about. But it was really wonderful to have Dr. Sarah Coupland, Dr. Farooz, Dr. Heather, and Dr. Maxwell, who had to rush, he's the chief resident, who had to rush to the OR, I think. So he messaged me. And of course, Hena, for all the support. Thank you so much, all the participants. This webinar would not be successful, would not be a learning experience if all of you were not there from all over the globe. Thank you to the IT department for enabling this. And thank you again to the speakers for for agreeing and for participating and for teaching all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye then. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.